My name is Craig Simmons and we're here today as part of the International Association of Hydrogeologists uh, time capsule project and it's with great pleasure um, that we are interviewing Warren Wood. Um, a little bit of background, um, Warren uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting in 1996 when I was in graduate school. I um, visited the United States Geological Survey in Reston for several months as part of my PhD uh, and met Warren for the first time then and uh, we have stayed in touch um, ever since really. I've had the, the fortune of um, working with Warren on some research papers and uh, really in many respects being mentored and so on by Warren. So um, look Warren, it's great to, to have you here this morning. Uh, we look forward in the process of the time capsule taping to exploring um, you know, all of the things that you've been up to over the last 40 plus years. The great uh, grey beard, yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the great grey beard yes. um, in your career as a hydrologist and a hydrogeochemist <clears throat> with the USGS, but also more broadly. So, uh, welcome. Thank you I'd very like, much. I'd like to, um, if uh, we can, just start right at the very beginning and talk a little bit uh, about your childhood and youth. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and raised? Yes, I uh, was born actually in a suburb of Detroit called Pontiac, Michigan. And uh, shortly thereafter, my father died and my uh, mother moved myself and my sister, who was 14 years older than, my, than I am, uh, to a small community in southwestern Michigan called Lawton, Michigan, and where she was employed as a math teacher and as a home economics teacher in this small school. Yeah. And so I essentially grew up in a rural, uh, very isolated community and uh, uh, was sort of a normal ne'er-do-well in terms of high school. Uh, if your mother is a teacher, a math teacher in particular, you don't want to do really well in math. Uh, in <laughs> fact, you don't want to do really well academically. It's best if you drive a fast car and attract the young ladies that way rather than uh, through academic excellence. So I was a poor student and uh, um, in my high school days. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. How did you... Um, so how did you move from that sort of background and the fast cars and, and ladies and so on into your undergraduate degree at university? What, what did you study? How did you move into that? Well, I, uh, I was always, always interested in uh, sort of technical things, and so I went into chemical engineering. I'd done, I had a really wonderful high school chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. And I just really enjoyed chemistry, and so uh, rather than majoring in chemistry, I thought, well, perhaps the, uh, the opportunity for employment was better as a chemical engineer. I knew a chemical engineer who made $100 a week, and that was an incredible amount of money. And so this was coming from a rather meager, or a, a meager economic background. $100 a week sounded pretty good to me. So... Anyway, I started off university as a uh, chemical engineer, and uh, uh, this uh, was, uh, again, I went to the university and I, it was just incredible experience. I met people from all over the world, and I had never, I'd come from this small community, I'd never heard of Picasso, I'd never heard of Freud, and all of a sudden there was this wonderful intellectual environment, and uh, unfortunately I spent more time in the intellectual environment that I did on my academics uh, and uh, I made the dean's list. Uh, this is the dean's list. If you don't shape up, you're out of here. Not, <laughs> not the good dean's list, which we're going to give you a promotion. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was just mucking along, just barely surviving. And uh, I, uh, I was a junior uh, at this time. At, the, at that time, and I don't know whether it exists presently, but at that time, as an engineering student, you had very few electives. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until my beginning of my junior year that there was an opportunity for a, uh, uh, to take an elective. And my mother had uh, purchased a small cabin in northern Ontario. And in that process, uh, the, we, was, we drove up through there. We went through some of the most contorted-looking rocks, the road cuts. Their things were twisted and folded. and strange colors and wonderful textures and and so I thought well my course then my 
that I was going to take as uh, my elective was going to be geology. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in Geology 101 from Dr. Jim Fisher. Mm -hmm. This man changed my life. Well, Within yeah. two weeks after I enrolled, mm -hmm. I knew that this is where I wanted to go in geology. Mm -hmm. It was a really one of those epiphanal moments that this is it. And uh, as a consequence, my grades, I did make the dean's list, but this time on the upper end, not the lower end. And well, so it, my whole career turned around, and uh, I just was interested in, uh, in geology. And uh, so that's, that was the sort of the undergraduate part, and I just kind of ex continued to this into my master's, uh, which I did a thesis on uh, reversely polarized uh, olivine diabase dikes. Now that's a grabber, isn't it? <laughs> and really societally relevant. Well, yeah. it turns out that it was just the time the geophysics revolution was going on with plate tectonics, and we were calling it polar wandering at that time because wow. nobody yeah. really felt that the continents could move around. Mm -hmm. But the poles wandered. Well, these were really interesting uh, times to look at geophysics, and so I was very much interested in the geophysics. And uh, uh, of course in my thesis where I had a beautiful layout of how the continents must have moved, that was ex told by my professor, get out of there, that's just speculation, don't, don't keep that in a thesis. So it was just poor wandering, that's mm -hmm. how we resolved that. Anyway, uh, so that was the, the end of my master's uh, thing. I'd been i uh, married at that time uh, and had a, a small child, mm -hmm. my son, Warren T. And uh, it was quite clear that I needed to generate some income uh, other than uh, I was working at a men's store uh, selling men's clothes and I was working at a gas station repairing oh. cars. Mm -hmm. Getting back to my early days of cars, I never really have gotten away from cars. I'm still a car guy. But nevertheless, uh, I had to get a real job, and uh, uh, Bill uh, Fisher, or uh, um, uh, Bill Hines, my advisor in my master's uh, thesis, uh, had a contact with the Michigan Highway Department. And they were looking, this was just the start of the interstate uh, highway development mm -hmm. in the early 60s. And they needed to look for a geophysics to look for roadbed development. Uh, so this was really engineering geology, uh, what is application, and look for areas for uh, what they call borrow or fill or sand and gravel to use as fill material. So I spent uh, two years as a geophysicist uh, looking uh, about the state of Michigan. I had a great opportunity to just go over the whole state of Michigan. But meantime, my wife uh, was home with this new baby, and I was on the road all the time. It was not the most ideal of situations. And the job, while interesting, looked like there was no future. It would just be kind of doing geophysical, applied, seismic, and earth resistivity in yet another spot. It just didn't, wasn't intellectually challenging. But it did provide a good income. So I decided to go back. I, would I really wanted to go back to the university uh, for a doctorate, and uh, it was more philosophical than practical, and I was going to do a, a um, study on an igneous petrology problem. I still hadn't seen the light. I was still <laughs> in igneous petrology. Uh, again, because of my chemistry background, I could kind of look at uh, the chemistry, the work that the petrologists have done, and it all made sense to me. So it was a, a natural fit. And as soon as I got back to, I had been accepted for university work, uh, it became apparent that I needed a source of income. And uh, the U.S. Geological Survey was, had a position opening for a hydrologic technician two, mm -hmm. and uh, this meant that I measured water levels, I gauged streams, and I did uh, collected samples. Uh, on, I could do it on weekends and evenings and later in the afternoons, and when it so it fit my schedule uh, rather nicely. So was this while you were still doing this, graduate school? This is why I was doing graduate work, and. Okay. Uh, and so I just continued to work with the USGS, but then I recognized that 
the U.S., this was a groundwater branch. It was before the U.S. Geological Survey had, was integrated into Water Resource Division. We used uh -huh. to have a groundwater branch, a surface water branch, and a quality water branch. Uh -huh. And they weren't in the same towns necessarily, or they just were totally separate units. And then in, a, I don't know, sometime in the middle 60s, early middle 60s, I think it was, they integrated into Water Resource Division. But uh, I sort of, sort of uh, kind of got interested in the chemistry. I, uh, part of my role was to go out and collect water samples, and, and uh, is, we had uh, countywide investigations where we would look at a, the water resources of Van Buren County or Kalamazoo County or Oakland County, mm -hmm. and we would try to evaluate the water resources. And of course, I was a junior member of, of these, this team. And part of my work was to go out and collect uh, water samples for water chemistry. Now there was no, there was still this water quality branch, and we used to send our samples to Columbus, Ohio, for analysis. Mm -hmm. And they would come back. Your water contained such and such, and that was the total. It was just analytical. There was no geochemical interpretation. Mm -hmm. And my again, my chemical background said, "Gee, there's." a little more here than meets the eye. We can do a little something interesting. So I proposed a, uh, a thesis uh, to work in uh, groundwater of a study area that the USGS was working. It was called the Tri-County Area, included Ingham, Eaton, and Clinton County, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And it was the water resources, but I was kind of given the responsibility of uh, of looking at the water quality, well, not the geochemistry, but the water quality. So it gave me an excuse to go out and collect samples, but I could also think a little bit about what they meant in terms of the flow system. Mm -hmm. And I was, the thesis was dealing with uh, ultrafiltration or reverse osmosis. And that was a big thing in the early 60s. If water moves through a membrane, does it does the membrane retain the solutes and leave only dilute water on the other side of the down gradient side of the membrane? And uh, we looked at uh, the uh, Saginaw Formation, which is a shale sandstone sequence. And uh, to my satisfaction, anyway, I think we could identify that uh, the concept was uh, a viable and that there was chemical differences on the other, either sides of these membranes and some isotopic differences as well. Uh, so that was the thesis and fortunately there was enough evidence in a positive sense that I was granted a PhD for this work. And so that's sort of my uh, academic uh, mm -hmm. uh, career. And then you, at around 1970, wasn't it, yes. that you moved into the USGS then? As oh, well, a, I was more full-time. Yeah, they had a position opening. As a research and, hydrologist? Well, no, I no. still was uh, in, this would have been in 68 or uh -huh. so. I took a regular full-time position. Up to that point, it had been either a hydrologic technician or a what we used to call WAE, work as employed. In other okay. words, if yeah. they needed you, you worked. If they didn't need you, you didn't work. Uh -huh. But anyway, I got a full-time, as we would call in the academic world, a tenure-track position. Yeah. And uh, uh, I worked in the, in the uh, state of Michigan for until about 1970. And then in 1970, I'd finished my uh, PhD in 69 and was looking for greener pastures. An opportunity came to move to Lubbock, Texas, mm. uh, to work on the High Plains. Uh, they had uh, an idea that they wanted to bring water from the Mississippi River up to the High Plains, which is about a thousand meters, and they uh, wanted to store this water in the depleted Ogallala Aquifer. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, how do we get this water down there? Was it artificial recharge from what we call artificial recharge at that time? Uh, would it be through wells? Would it be through spreading basins? How would be the best way to do it? Mm -hmm. It was quite clear 
that you couldn't bring up water in the quantity that you needed for irrigation at the time that you needed it. So you had to bring up small quantities over a year and store it and then utilize it. That was the strategy. Of course, the economics of the thing are insane. There was going to be, I think, 15 or 16 nuclear reactors just to generate the, the electricity needing to lift this water a thousand meters. So, uh, the economics always looked very strange, but it turns out the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, George Mahan, was from Lubbock, Texas. And a chairman of the House Appropriations Committee is one of the most powerful positions in the United States Congress. And so there was a direct line item in the U.S. budget to fund this project. Uh, my guess is, and I don't know this, but my guess is it had been offered to 50 other people, and they said, my God, move to Lubbock, Texas. What a terrible thing, you know. Lubbock, Texas, it didn't have the reputation. It uh, it's a, actually turns it's a nice city, but it, sort of in a remote area of the world. And uh, so I, I don't know what happened. But anyway, I was offered the position. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a great opportunity for a young PhD. Gosh, there was lots of money, and you could do anything you wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do this. OK, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. So it was a terrific opportunity. I had a great boss, Richmond Brown. Mm -hmm. I worked with a guy named Don Signer, who was a really good engineer. I wanted to do something. He, well, we have to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And he was a great guy to work with. Mm -hmm. So it was just a terrific opportunity. So when did you leave Texas and where where did you go next? Okay, then I, uh, I, let me see, at this time, I taught also, while I was there, I started teaching a groundwater course mm -hmm. at Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. We were located on the campus of Texas Tech. And I just wanted to always kind of be involved with teaching as part of my academic background. So I taught a groundwater course. And anyway, it, uh, there was a, an opportunity uh, came to uh, John Bredehoff, uh, who had been uh, on this High Plains project. Interesting, this high, if I can back up a second. Yeah. The High Plains project had mm -hmm. some interesting advisors. John Bredehoff, who was one, who was a really brilliant guy. And the other was C.V. Tice. Mm -hmm. And so I had a terrific opportunity to get some real insight from two giants uh, yeah. of the field. What wow. a great experience for a young Ph.D. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, unbelievable. But anyway, John recruited me to take a position as the uh, assistant chief for the Office of Radio Hydrology in mm -hmm. Reston, Virginia, headquarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, uh, at that point, the disposal of low-level uh, nuclear waste was a major uh, concern. There had been some evidences of leakage in the previous uh, sites, and there was a lot of hydrologic investigation, and DOE, uh, NRC, uh, EPA and the USGS were forming these task groups to kind of look and see where we wanted to go, what should policy be, what should the hydrology be. And I was involved with uh, sort of the administration of that uh, program. Uh, I worked with George DeBucanani, who was the chief of the uh, uh, Office of Radio Hydrology, and he again was fortunate, I was fortunate, and he gave me kind of free reign to uh, to do things that I thought were interesting. Uh, unfortunately, there was an awful lot of just administrative uh, coordinating meetings between these four agencies. Mm -hmm. And the EPA at that time was having a huge turnover of personnel. So every meeting you'd have, you'd have to go over everything that had ever been happened before. And so this whole, for a year, it was just mm -hmm. uh, uh, frustrating mm -hmm. uh, for me as a technical person. It just here I was trying to encourage people to do these technical projects where I'd rather be doing them myself than, yeah. than trying to talk somebody and, oh, I don't want to go to this, you know, Beatty, Nevada, that's terrible, or whatever. Well, you know, it's an interesting system. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is, uh, uh, and my wife uh, w moved with me, uh, and my son, and uh, my wife couldn't get a job, and she was not happy and uh, she'd always worked, and uh, it just, she couldn't get a job as a librarian. She's a librarian. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, uh, 
uh, I, I, Texas Tech had offered me a, an academic position. Uh, one day, it was just the most incredible week in my life. I had left on Sunday for a meeting at uh, Battelle in, in uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, so I left for a Monday morning meeting. So I left on Sunday. And then I had a, uh, a Tuesday meeting in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And then I had a Thursday meeting in San Francisco. Uh, and then I got back and they called a, an emergency meeting for Saturday morning at uh, the test site in Nevada. And, uh, you know, back and forth across the country uh, three or four times in one week. And at that time, Monday morning, uh, uh, the former chairman of the geology department had given me a call. Bill Miller was his name. He said, gee, we're looking for a groundwater hydrologist. Are you interested? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, it was, it just was right for me. Mm -hmm. So I picked up and went, moved back to Lubbock, Texas. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's a famous song about seeing Lubbock in your rearview mirror. Well, I sought my windshield a couple of times. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, oh, I must uh, must digress. Uh, my first visit to Lubbock before on my first stint, I was staying in a motel, and it was May 11th, 1970, and I was struck by a tornado. Wow. The tornado uh, came in. I, I it started to get really stormy outside, and it started to hail, and there were large hailstones. I mean, the size of uh, of base, baseballs. I mean, large stuff. And I had always heard that. If, you know, they were concentric, and I thought, well, I'll get one of these suckers and, and cut it in half and, you know, see if I could see the concentric circle. Well, let me tell you, if you get hit by one of those things, it really smarts. So I went out to get a couple of them, and I got hit, and I said, this is not good. So I got back into my motel, and just then the uh, windows blew out of the hotel, and I, the storm is getting pretty severe, and so I tried to get under the bed, and the bed had little legs like about this tall, and I couldn't get under the bed, so I kind of scrunched it up against the wall, and just then the car blew in on top of the bed. And uh, the whole roof went off, and uh, turns out 26 people were killed in, in this uh, little tornado. Uh, I, was, I was for months picking out little pieces of uh, tile, because all the roofs in that area are these uh, red tile roofs, yeah. very picturesque, but very lethal. Yeah. Uh, the car looked like a bomb had exploded. It looked like something out of a Beirut. I mean, there was holes, no matter how you looked at it, where these tile had gone through the car. Anyway, welcome to Lubbock. But I went back, so I'm a slow learner, I guess, is what I conclude. Okay, that's really interesting. So how did you then get back to the USGS in Reston? Okay, well, back <laughs> <laughs> after three years as an academic at Texas Tech, yeah. where I had developed a courses in groundwater and groundwater geochemistry, mm -hmm. I got a call one day from Ike Winograd. Mm -hmm. I said, gee, we're looking for... Uh, They'd had it. This is a time when people were leaving the USGS, forming consulting uh, firms, and so they had some positions in uh, in the research branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, "Gee, are you interested?" And again, I thought, "Well, it was the interest rates on homes were just outrageous at that time. You had to the common rate was eighteen, nineteen percent. It well, was during one of those uh -huh. terrible economic bubbles." And, you know, the pay was not much different. It was going to be an economic net loss. But I, I kind of thought that this was research. This is where I really wanted to go. And my wife was, even though she had a position in Lubbock, and we hadn't gotten one when we were in Reston before, uh, she agreed to move. And my son was at the university at this time, so that was of a less uh, consequence. And in uh, any event, uh, we moved back to uh, Reston, and I became part of the NRP, or the yeah. National Research Program, and the rest is history, as they say. And so what <laughs> year is this, for? Okay, this would have been about 1980 or 81. Okay, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And there were some great people there. Uh, Cliff Voss was just coming in, Al yeah. Shapiro. Lenny Kanika was there, and uh, Ward Sanford just came in a year or so later. Uh, 
Chris Nuzel was there. And then from the geochemistry, the group that I kind of tied in intellectually and emotionally with, Bill Back was there, yeah. Bruce Hanshaw. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, Blair Jones. So there was a really wonderful opportunity. I was, again, still relatively young guy surrounded by these giants. Mm -hmm. What a just diffuse opportunity to learn. No matter if you had lunch with them, you always picked up some little yeah. gem. Really interesting experience. Uh, it just you couldn't have designed a, a better situation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you already mentioned uh, C. V. Tice. And yeah. The history of the group. Yeah. And, uh, and Oscar Meinzer. Yeah. And, I mean, what, so it must have been just an incredible sort of sensation and opportunity, really. Well, it was to... just surrounded by people who really knew what they were doing. I remember Bill Beck had Osc uh, uh, Meinzer's desk. That was in his office, wow. his drafting table. Little, had, Bill had a little plaque uh -huh. made, this was uh, Meinzer's in. People had bits and pieces of equipment that these guys had used in little niches in their office. It was really cool. And C.V. Tice was an interesting guy when yeah. I worked with him. Uh -huh. uh, it, it was in about 1970, uh, 68, about 70, 71, mm -hmm. and uh, that he was uh, on the High Plains Project. And he was an interesting guy. He was a, a little hard to uh, deal with. Uh, he had kind of a funny person, interesting, but funny personality. He'd kind of say something, a <laughs> little giggle, and uh, it's kind of an interesting, but. Uh, he really had some insight into, obviously, into the, how the, the high planes worked and what, how we should approach uh, our analysis of whether we could uh, artificially recharge this environment. So, and like, how did that feel working with CV? Wow. I mean, was it intimidating, exhilarating? Uh, um, what did you can you reflect and do you think, oh wow, I learnt something really important there? Or how, uh, how do you reflect on, on that opportunity? I think it was more of a historical, just being associated with it. I don't know as I walked away with any great insight, uh -huh. or, uh, but it was just terrific to here was the guy that developed the the, the equations that we were that I had been using, and you know he thought about it. Uh -huh. Very interesting, but I, you know, I don't know as I got any any great insight from uh, that. I did get some from. Uh, John Bredoff, a very bright guy, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, knew kind of, he had a vision of where he thought uh, the hydrology should go, and he was a very forceful, dynamic speaker, mm -hmm. and uh, just to put it in a politically correct terms, he was a very forceful guy, and, but he had a great vision of where the, to take the survey, he wanted the survey to go. So when you reflect back yeah. on those early years, would you say, John as one of you know one of your strong influences oh, absolutely. and positive influences. Absolutely, yeah. uh, along with Bill Back, yeah. uh, who uh, uh, Bruce was at that time sort of migrating into more administration. He kind of wanted to uh, getting away from more of the technical, and he was a assist, I think he went to assistant director for research or went up into the head office. Anyway, I had less and less contact with Bruce, mm -hmm. and he became. Um, uh, more involved with administration and less than the technical. Bill stayed in the in the technical area throughout mm -hmm. all the time of his career. Yeah, it was really interesting. And yeah. so we touched. Um, so you've now moving at this point in the early 1980s firmly into a very research um, oriented career, and you, you know obviously this is where you want to go and where you want to head. Um, but you'd already had some experience with the university and academia. And this has obviously been a thread that's run through your career. Yeah. I mean, you've um, come back to Michigan State University some 30 odd years later, 40 years later after graduate. Years later, yeah. After you know, certainly undergraduate 50 years yeah. ago and then graduate school and now as a um, visiting professor at MSU. and. Um, and also your um, relationship as a fellow at St. Catherine's College mm -hmm. at Oxford. So um, how do, <clears throat> do you sort of reflect on, you know, sort of this research position at the USGS versus life as a professor at the university? And you know, how, 
Would you do anything differently there, well, or if you could, or no, have you well, like balancing those? And... Well, it, it turns out no. I, I I just think I've been incredibly lucky. It's always better to be lucky than smart, and I've been really lucky, uh -huh. and I've just had great opportunities and been surrounded by terrific people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the USGS had the most wonderful cadre of, of people that you could ever hope to be around. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the. Uh, um, the, the, the situation at Oxford was kind of interesting. I had been working on the High Plains. There was a project with the U.S. Geological Survey called the RASA, stands for uh, Regional Aquifer Systems Analysis. They looked at the big picture aquifers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had worked in the High Plains previously, and so I tried to get my research work kind of oriented towards this RASA because mm -hmm. they had some funding to, to do some things. Mm -hmm. and. Ward Sanford and I uh, were working on the High Plains. Uh, Ward had just come on board, and and Lenny was his mentor and supervisor initially. And uh, Lenny felt that Ward needed some field experience, and I'm a field guy. <laughs> and so Ward and I we hit it off well together. And I took him into the field, and and he really he's got a terrific skill set. He's a really really bright guy with a great skill set in sim modeling and also conceptualizing. He's really good at conceptualizing a, uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, Ward and I have been working on the High Plains with a guy and, and we had some local drilling done by a, a guy named at the university named C.C. Reeves, Tex Reeves. And uh, at the same time, and I didn't know it, Tex was working with a, a chap at Oxford, Andrew Gowdy, who had a PhD student, Stephen Stokes, who came and visited Tex uh, Reeves and uh, actually utilized some of our drilling equipment that we had worked with uh, uh, Tex to develop. As Tex had his own drilling rig. He was a geologist with his own drilling rig. So uh, anyway, it, it turns out that uh, I hadn't, didn't really know I would heard the name Stephen Stokes, but I didn't know anything really about it. And I was at a meeting in Turkey, and no, it was uh, Oman, Jordan. And all of a sudden, this guy comes up to me and he says, you're Warren Wood. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I'm Stephen Stokes, and he's a New Zealander, so he's got the <laughs> nice New Zealand twang. and. Uh, <coughs> And then we got talking about how our mutual friend, and I explained to my interest in, in hydrology was not so much the water resources aspect of it as it was the, the geologic uh, interaction of fluid flows and the, the interplay between geology and water and water and geology. And he thought that was rather interesting, and he set up a position uh, for me to visit uh, at Oxford for a, a term there on a three eight-week terms. Mm -hmm. And so I got a little leave of absence from the survey to take this uh, semester at, uh, or term at Oxford as the uh, Christian, Christensen Fellow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that turned out to be worthwhile and they kept inviting me back and I team taught some courses and uh, I've had a continual uh, relation. Uh, Stephen Stokes has left uh, Oxford, but his student, Richard Bailey, and I are just published a paper last year together, and we're continuing to work on going to Qatar in a couple of weeks and, and picking up some more samples to do OSL dating, optical stimulated luminescence dating, is what Stephen did and what uh, 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 Richard Bailey is doing. Mm -hmm. So that's my sort of Oxford connection, and uh, they've treated me very well at uh, St. Catharines College. Mm -hmm. I welcome to come and stay there at any time. And I'm sitting, here's a, a little guy from southwestern Michigan at high table with the robes and all that. <laughs> it's a, really a very interesting experience. Oh, it must be amazing. <laughs> oh, and you, you, the one chap on your left, you just won the Nobel Prize in, in literature, and the, the chap on the right has maybe gotten a Nobel in, uh, in physics, or the vet across the, across the table there has just published the definitive work on the Ottoman Empire. And so the conversations at High Table were just truly a, 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 a revolution to me, and, 
and to see this kind of banter at this level was a terrific experience. No, I know, and I know mm. from our conversations over the years mm. that you always reflected very fondly about Oxford. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> and it was just this dumb luck that I happened to be working with this guy Tex Reeves, and yeah. and uh, and you know, so it's a sort of one of these happiest things. You can't say you plan something like that. It just mm. uh, just happened. It's an amazing sort of range of experiences. So, Warren, can we um, turn now to um, some of your scientific contributions and your research contributions? So, um, you've done a lot of work, um, salt lakes research, subcas, aeolian transport of salts, um, a, a bunch of work on chemical hydrogeology, chloride mass balance and recharge estimation, radon, dolomite, dolomite proto-dolomite, and, and the list goes on. Um, how do you reflect on how your research has come together? Um, you know, what's the balance, you know, perhaps of strategy versus opportunity? Um, how, tell us a little bit about your contributions, the, 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 the makeup of your research career and your contributions. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. It, it looks very... Uh as you look at the, the topics, they look very strange and unrelated. But again, the, the, the theme should be that there's a geologic component that runs through there. And it's sort of mass and energy flux of water uh, and, and energy going through the geologic system. And so when I uh, looked at the uh, Southern High Plains, Ward and I were working there, uh, it became uh, what the it has an interesting topographic feature. There's 20 some thousand of these very small Playa Lakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had generally considered to be uh, areas, uh, they called them discharge areas, but there were no saline minerals at all in them mm -hmm. at all. But they looked like they had a very tight clay. It's called a Randall clay. It was very, very impermeable. And if you ran a lab test on it, it you know, it's infinitesimally small hydraulic conductivity, so they were not considered part of the hydrologic environment. They were uh, just considered to be places where you put trash because you couldn't farm them because they occasionally flooded every two or three years and uh, whenever you'd have a rainstorm in the event. So they were not part of the hydrologic cycle. And yet, as soon as I looked at them, I said, gee, there's no saline minerals here. They get filled with water. If they're evaporating, why isn't there some salinity associated? Mm -hmm. They must be involved with recharge. Well, they're originally thought to originate from buffalo wallows. That was one of the early hypotheses. Uh, but uh, the, the literature was just kind of more speculative. And I had a, a student do some uh, vertical profiles of CO2 in the unsaturated zone. We went down to about 30 meters. This was left over from the earlier uh, work that Ed Weeks had done. He was very much interested in air permeability and how you relate air permeability because we were going to put in artificial recharge, we were going to put water in the unsaturated zone. So we had to know something about the what would the hydraulic conductivity or permeability distribution in the unsaturated zone was. And Ed developed uh, uh, so air pumping tests. And anyway, in the process, there were these leftover uh, tubes that were piezometers in the unsaturated zone. And we had uh, a little sampling activity and where we could monthly, we, we sampled uh, the uh, carbon dioxide and uh, primarily carbon dioxide is just natural from these uh, tubes. And it was quite clear when you start calculating the fluxes that there was a huge carbon dioxide flux out of the system. Well, the Ogallala is Miocene in age, and one would guess that any carbon that had been deposited would long since have been gone. And so that meant that there had to be a source of carbon coming into the system. Well, it turns out, with some other additional work, we could show that it was particulate material migrating elution of material, particulate material, down through the unsaturated zone. It was bringing the carbon on the surface down, and when we looked at the uh, carbon-14 of this, it was modern. 
Uh, and so it was, again, consistent with what we uh, had seen. And so we could show that there are these uh, attempted to show, and this is work I did with Wade Osterkamp, that we uh, uh, could show that these were formed by dissolution. They were essentially karst features. Mm -hmm. Across the surface of the southern high plains is a thick calcrete, uh, caliche, as a soil evaporated calcium carbonate. Well, it was dissolution of these that was forming these uh, playas. Mm -hmm. the, the oleum processes along the surface would create little swales, mm -hmm. little depressions. Of these would, there would be some runoff to it, and this would in, get organic material and ultimately develop into these. Things. So that was uh, a first sort of uh, looking at uh, the origin of uh, these playa lakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Ward, we did some work on the origin. There's 40 or 50 large saline lakes. Mm -hmm. And we did some work with showing that, in fact, it was a groundwater hitting a bedrock, forcing it up and over, that prevented the development of calcrete associated with bedrock outcrops. And that, that ultimately, when the water level dropped, these were e evacuated by uh, eolian processes mm -hmm. and formed the basins. Mm -hmm. And so that got kind of interested in eolian processes, mm -hmm. both of those two, and I thought, well, is there any, any kind of uh, solutes associated with this? You sit on a, a saline lake, as you have no doubt <laughs> in Australia, you know that smart your eyes because there's salt in this thing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you breathe it and you taste it, it tastes salty. And so what can we devise a method of quantifying how much salt is blown out of, of a playa lake or one of these saline lakes? And so Ward Sanford and I again set up a procedure where we looked and actually calculated the amount, the mass, the tons of chloride being blown out of one of mm -hmm. these things in a year. And I've extended that work in some in Botswana, mm -hmm. looking at a large uh, playa basin, or pans as they call them in South Africa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the last work was a couple was published a couple of years ago showing that hexavalent chrome uh, from the Oman Ophiolites is eolian transported throughout the uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. So that this, in fact, it's, it, it's at levels of over one milligram per liter, which are way beyond what drinking levels should be. But this is eolian transport. It's a sort of a geogenic uh, natural hazard, if you will. It's really... Um Really amazing, isn't it? I mean, that's a nice segue into your work in the Middle East. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been, well, gosh, it's very hard to do this um, so briefly, isn't it? But the work that you've done over well, the last 50 20, years. Yeah, 20, well, and certainly what the last 20 or 30 years of yeah. working in the Middle East, in yeah. UAE, in Saudi Arabia, and so on, on Sabka, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the like. Just, you know, how did you get into that work over the, in, in Africa? Well, it was in, in the Middle East, it was started sort of yeah. interesting. Uh, I had worked with Don Signer in the uh, program in uh, Lubbock, Texas when I first arrived. Well, Don had taken a position with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey. had just opened an office in El Ain in the United Arab Emirates. The, the, emirate, the emirate of Abu Dhabi, which mm -hmm. is seven emirates, mm -hmm. but emirate, the emirate of Abu Dhabi was keen to look at their water resources. And they feel, felt that they had hired in the past some consultants and they didn't think they got a good value for their uh, investment. And so they wanted the USGS to come in. It was, they paid the full funding. There was no federal government involved, but they wanted the USGS expertise. So they started a program over there and Don Signer was interested in going over there and he went over in 1988, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they were there a couple of years, and they realized that they didn't have any water quality or nothing about geochemistry. And Don said, "Gee, you know, there's a uh, you want to come over and visit and and uh, see if there you can help set up a little program and see where we can go." Mm -hmm. And uh, as a consequence, I went over there. I was scheduled to go over January fifteenth, uh, nineteen ninety, 
Well, that's a very interesting day, and I mention that because that's the day that Desert Storm started, uh, mm -hmm. the military response to the invasion of, of Kuwait. And so, needless to say, I was delayed. It was not a good idea to be flying around the Middle East uh, during a, we got F-16s and whatever flying around. It's, uh, it was a little hazardous. So I got over there in April, and by that time the oil fields were still burning in Kuwait. In fact, you'd wake up every morning and there would be soot all over the cars. You'd have to wash the windshield uh, from the oil fires burning in Kuwait, which was probably six, seven hundred kilometers uh, further north and west. But in any event, I went over there and, and I did the water resources. They were interested in water resources and I kind of helped them set up the water quality and what they needed to sample and how they should sample and things of that nature. And when I was a, was a graduate student, there was a big flurry of activity about sabkas as being mm -hmm. uh, the source of dolomite. Well, we finally solved the dolomite problem, which has been a problem in the literature for tens of years. Uh, that they were all formed in sabkas and they had this vision where they had bringing seawater and refluxing through and and uh, and I looked at that and I got over there and I said gee you know that doesn't make a lot of hydrologic sense <laughs> there's something wrong here and uh, so I dug a few pits and got a few samples and did some analyses and uh, gosh this stuff didn't look like seawater there's no way you could get from seawater uh, to what we observed and then you know you think about the hydrogeology of the system here over 150 kilometers away you got 2,000 kilometer or 2,000 meter high mountains that are all focusing towards this you've got head this is probably groundwater discharge mm -hmm. and uh, so once you make that assumption you can start calculating the mass fluxes into this system and do some hydraulic conductivities and it turns out the gradient is very, very flat. It's one in 7,000, so there's just not much stuff moving through the sabka at all. Mm -hmm. And anyway, through a series of uh, chemistry and, and hydro, hydrogeologic studies, again, uh, working with uh, Ward Sanford, I collared Ward to bring him over, and <laughs> he's my go-to guy. He is a really, really good guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we looked at, at these uh, sapkas and determined that they probably had it wrong when the seawater, it was just uh, groundwater discharge, or in this case, deep basin brines. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads me, actually, to why I'm sitting here in Australia <laughs> today yeah. is that I'm working with your colleague Vincent Post on yeah. uh, trying to get another model for the mm -hmm. origin of dolomite. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I worked in the Sapkas and uh, uh, published a few papers and the stuff in the UAE and then people with the head Sabkas in Saudi Arabia were interested. Why well, don't you come over here and look at this? And, and people in South Africa. I had a student that I worked with at uh, Oxford, uh, Frank Eckhart, who took his, uh, or after finishing at Oxford, went to South Africa. And he uh, said, gee, we've got these wonderful pans over there. Why don't you come on over and take a look at those? And so we did a little paper on uh, the pans in, in South Africa or uh, Botswana. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of one thing led to another. And then the Saudis were very interesting as they saw the economic potential of these uh, sabkas. They're more than just kind of casual uh, topographic features, they actually contain fairly high concentrations of magnesium and potassium that under certain circumstances could have some economic uh, potential. Mm -hmm. In any event, the Saudis were interested to see what they are. So I went over there and, and uh, gave them a couple lectures and they were kind of keen to have me come back and they offered me a position as a, an adjunct professor in mm -hmm. King Faud University in mm -hmm. uh, Dahran. Mm -hmm. So I've been going back and forth there for, in fact, I'm on my way over there in April for <laughs> a, a, teach a short course and uh, go to a, uh, some things. So can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done in, in um, the Sabkas looking at um, 
free conviction. I recall a conversation yeah. that you and I had in Australia, actually. I think it was in the late 1990s where we were having a beer at a pub, <laughs> as you do. Yes. Sort of, and I'd been sort of for a long while looking at these things quite theoretically in, in modelling and so on, and really um, on a quest to try and find fingers and convective fingering and instabilities and free convection in the food. And you said, Boy, have I got the site for you. <laughs> um, the most homogenous yeah. and isotropic geologic sands and materials. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. um, take us forward. Well, we, uh, as you po pointed out, that there had been a lot of theoretical work, but the uh, convection had not been identified in the field. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of secondary evidence that mm. it exists. And when I was doing the Sapco work with Ward, we hypothesized that there yep. must be recharge from the surface, taking these surface uh, salts uh, that accumulate on the surface, dissolving them and going down. But because we found tritium everywhere, mm -hmm. and so it was quite clear that there was, uh, you know, circulation in that system. And how do you get circulation? And how do you get mixing uh, of waters in this? And so it was hypothesized that this was the case. Mm -hmm. But I had a conversation with, I believe it was you, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm trying to think who else had a GSA meeting in, uh, I can't even remember mm -hmm. where we were, but sitting around again, a was pub a, with a beer and a napkin. And, it was 2007 or thereabouts, yeah, wasn't right. it? Yeah, right. I can't yeah. remember where, well, I can't remember yeah. the GSA. But anyway, we said, uh, yeah. you know, you had pointed out that Jack Sharp had a, uh, just gotten a new geophysical instrument that mm -hmm. looked like it might be able to identify these. Yeah, things. it was electrical it, resistivity imaging. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, but it was a new div that allowed really more, much more precise in the past. I think it was the super sting. Yeah, the super sting. sting. <laughs> that was a, shouldn't yeah. I should remember yeah, was, that. Yeah. Yes. Well, anyway, it turns out we had just hired a new uh, a geophysicist at, at Michigan State. I was at Michigan State at that time. And... Uh, uh, named Rumke van Dam, and he, as part of his startup package, had purchased one of these things. And I said, "Wow, we got the great, a great place to try this thing out." <laughs> okay. And yeah, so yeah, right. uh, uh, we uh, uh, we said, "Okay, let's go over to the Abu Dhabi. It was relatively easy access. You can get stuff in and out of the country. It's not a it's it's a real easy country to deal with, mm -hmm. and culturally, and and uh, it's easy to work with." work in it. The environment's a little tricky. It gets kind of warm. It gets, you know, high 40s and it's, uh, it can be a little stressful at times. But so uh, we were over there and we set up this pro uh, um, network to, to measure this and of all good fortune, as I say, it's always better to be lucky than smart. About a hundred <laughs> days right. previously, yeah. <laughs> It had rained, uh, one of those events that doesn't occur only once in every 10 years. It got about 100 millimeters of rain, which yeah. is a huge rain for that area. The annual average is about 60 or 70. So all of a sudden, in one day or two days, they got this huge rain. Well, it just turns out that the timing couldn't have been better because they're right. beautiful fingers, mm -hmm. and they were clear and sharp. And then we've gone back two or three times since then, and these have all dissipated. And we kept the same electrodes in there, so the spacing was exactly the same, and it was dead right on. In fact, there is a paper in, as you are well aware, yeah. you were a co-author on that yep. work. Mm -hmm. And there's a, we had a student do a groundwater modeling to see whether it was, in fact, was it a, a result of material coming in from the top, or was it the result of, of brines coming in from below? Because you can get instability in either way. The brines coming in are actually less dense than the uh, material in the sabka, so you would have some instability. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I think his, um, it's in review as we speak, and I think that uh, his modeling suggests that it was, in fact, this rainfall in there. So it's a, again, uh, uh, one of the advantages of going to a GSA meeting and having a beer and getting a napkin and sketching things out. Yeah, and I actually did want to talk a little bit about that session with the napkin. Um, I can't remember if it was beer or coffee. Just a lot of well, good I, ideas I don't come want to up. Say. <laughs> yeah, so, but um, <clears throat> what I really remember, and I've reflected on that several times with my own colleagues and other colleagues and my own graduate students is just um, how impressed I was with the napkins and how <laughs> lucid and vivid and 
um, the planning discussion for that three or four hours with precise detail how you know you thought about the problem how we constructed some of the you know uh, methodology around you know attacking this issue of discovering free convection um, I wanted to think a little bit here about um, how you solve problems how you think about problems hmm. um, yeah, it was certainly not sort of left to chance. Let's just sort of grab a box of tools and go out to the Middle yeah. East. And very um, well planned, conceptualized. Uh, is that just how you work and operate? I guess, yeah, I, I think probably I'm, uh, m certainly all my modeling friends say that I'm totally intuitive. I couldn't model my way out of a, a men's room. So I, I, I have a geologic training, geologic background, and everything has to make sense uh, geologically. But I always have very con simple conceptual models of how things work. Mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in when you start out, again, you're always dealing with mass and energy flux in and out of control volumes. That's the kind of the simple uh, sort of an engineering background from mm -hmm. way back in chemical engineering. That's what you did. You start out with control volumes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my idea is always to start simple, and if it doesn't work, gee, we can add complexities as, as we go along. And there are always different choices in these complexities. You can, you can always overfiddle something, and you can, of course, make anything fit, but it's got to pass the smell test. It's got to, in fact, be rationally and reasonably based upon field observations. You yeah. can't just create something. It's got to fit. Does this geologically make sense? Does mm -hmm. this fit in the stratigraphy we see? Or does it fit into the, the, the mineralogy we see? How, what would be the best of two or three options to go? And I try to just add on to the... the so a little bit of Occam's razor? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Occam's razor. Yeah. It's where we want to go. Yeah. Keep it simple. You know, yeah. the, the old KISS principle that you taught in first year engineering keep it simple stupid mm -hmm. and so that's kind of my uh, guiding role I probably oversimplify things but it's it's easier for me to keep track of of uh, my little things coming in and out of my little box have you felt that I'm um, reflecting on 50 years of doing technical <laughs> and research work that that way of thinking that way of problem solving's evolved for you or was it really how you've always looked at and analyzed these sorts of No, I think this is uh, probably where Bre Britta Hoft and, and uh, mm -hmm. Ward Sanford taught me uh, how to think about these uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm not, I'm sure I didn't, wasn't as well, uh, didn't operate with this conceptual model as, uh, as I do now. I think it's one of those things you learn, mm -hmm. uh, and you learn from colleagues mm -hmm. that are a uh, great asset to you. I, I've worked with some people you've never heard of because they were people in the laboratory. I had a fellow who worked with me for 15 years, uh, uh, Terry Consul, who did just zillions of chemical analyses for me. And I could depend on really high quality chemical analysis. I didn't have to worry about that. I didn't want to be futzing around in a lab. I did that at one time, but I didn't want to. So Terry was great. And I had a, a secretary with a project share, Cunningham, who was just brilliant. My writing, I think, I think English is a foreign language to me. I have a difficulty writing. And Cher could take these ideas and just Gosh, you could turn them to prose. It was just, I was so fortunate in having people around me who could really help me. Mm -hmm. But and how much of that was opportunity versus uh, Warren Wood being the strategist, the, the research <laughs> team <laughs> conductor, bringing all of that together and well, that being was a research philosophy. leader? Yeah, yeah. It was a, we were a team. It yeah. was not, I'm hair doctor professor and you will do this. It was, mm -hmm. you know, I try to incorporate. That's my philosophy with graduate students. Yeah. You're part of a program. Here we're going to, you know, we're all part of this team. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's my feel. That's probably why I'd be a terrible administrator. I, I really think that you can't probably do that on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. but on a little research group I think it works well. Mm -hmm. So on that scale of sort of absolutely independent soloist technician this is sort of conducting a research team, research leadership, research management, do you sort of straddle both of those areas? Do you see yourself as really a sort of a technician, a core technician or a research manager 
in that sense? No, I don't really. Right. Uh, Just how you, yeah. yeah, I don't. I uh, I guess I've uh, I find things that I, I guess I'm a bit of a dilettante. I find things that interest me intellectually, mm. and then I kind of pursue them. But I kind of, uh, again, this management is not something that I'm conscious of. It's just that yeah. we're a team. Hey, we got, this is a, what we need to do. How do we get there yeah. from here? What's your input on yeah. this? So that's my style. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. It works for me. It's not necessarily the best thing for everybody. I mm -hmm. think it depends on your personality and depends on a lot of things, but it works for me. Yeah. Or it has. So, um, this might be a little bit of a hard one. We're going to ask it anyway. So, you, like you know, having pu published <laughs> the mass of journal papers that you have, if you reflect now, sort of back at the research contributions and so on, is it possible to say you know there was this one or two journal papers that you're most proud of, or that you think that have been most important or interesting or impactful? Choose how to answer this question as you will, Warren, but, you know, if, uh, so well, I think if, that ultimately there will be things that are highlights. What are some of those for you? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I've looked at, uh, I, I like to think that the contributions that I've made are ones that change the way we think about something. Mm -hmm. That's where I, now I don't necessarily want to put them in order, but for example, the, the origin of, of thick evaporite deposits. It's been an enigma. You should evaporate seawater, you should get a certain sequence of stuff. And yet you find, you know, 150 meters of halite and nothing else. Or you find 200 meters of, of gypsum and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it was a kind of an enigma. And and we changed that by looking at leakage from a closed basin. People had always assumed this was a closed basin. But if you allow a little leakage, you can get kind of any chemistry you want to. Mm -hmm. And so this changed the way people think about the origin of these thick uh, saline deposits. Again, the Sapkas, uh, having uh, flux from below, groundwater from below, kind of changed the way people addressed it. Uh, the high plains, uh, these were no longer just sort of the small plows were no longer features, they were an integrated part of the landscape and hydrology. Again, it changed the way people viewed them. Uh, another factor, another uh, model that I think uh, it, it hasn't gotten any play, but I think it was important, was the uh, a paper that I published almost 10 years ago now on on the origin of radon, and we developed a diffusional model that explained why radon was so high in groundwater, even though uranium is very modest uh, d uh, concentrations. It showed the diffusional uh, gradient of radium and absorption on the iron oxide faces of fractures where the water could get access and then radon. Mm -hmm. but. It, we we showed that in a, uh, with an interesting test that I think has not been developed, that it could be developed, uh, and I call it the solute stress test. And essentially it was, if you look back historically, you'll see that there's sort of two ways of looking at geophysics or aquifers. There's sort of self-potential like gravity and magnetics, and in hydrology we watched the water levels go up and down. We didn't stress the system. And then you you have a case where you're stressing the system in case of, of geophysics it's uh, you know seismic or electrical resistivity or you put a signal in a known signal in and mo monitor the response and we did the same thing hydrologically with pump tests mm -hmm. uh, well we haven't done as much of that in the chemistry we've essentially looked at the self potential we measure flow and the chemistry along a flow line but we really haven't stressed the systems the way that you would with a pumping test. And we did this with this uh, to look at the radium. We essentially did a step test, the equivalent of a step drawdown test, except we kept increasing the concentration mm -hmm. of a solution that we introduced into a recharge well and then monitored the output five meters away. Essentially, it integrated the whole kinds of chemistry that would happen if you had a spill or a 
uh, you were, say, you were designing a nuclear depository or a, just a way to the landfill, you'd want to know if, if it got away, if the solutes left the system, how would they react? And it's, you know, you can take cores and you can take run little laboratory experiments, but it's really kind of neat to see what if the ambient temperatures and pressures to introduce a, a solid, essentially a pumping test, if you will, and look at the, the stress, how that's responding. And I don't think that nobody has picked up on them that I'm aware of, but I, we did that with the radium, and I think that has uh, some potential societal potential. I don't want to say it's the greatest contribution because nobody's used it. It's got an author-reader ratio of one right now, so it's, it's uh, you know, I don't know what it's great. And I, I don't know, I, I'd say... Rather than an identifying individual thing, I say I have a legacy of, of looking at geology and flow, and that would be more how I would characterize it rather than uh, uh, an individual paper. You could always look, oh, citation indices. Oh, yeah, this paper is uh, higher. I'm not sure that's a great way to, to evaluate things. I, I have a little technique paper that's probably got the highest citation industries of my anything, and it's a... You know, how to sample in the unsaturated zone, you know, 1970. So uh -huh. that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting thing, yeah. isn't it? All the citation and yeah. performance metrics and evaluation yeah, I, metrics. I'm not <laughs> sure that that's a very good, I, I don't think it would reflect necessarily on my particular career. Yeah, well, that's excellent, Warren.